<clears throat> as you know, your do now was, is man inherently good or evil? What makes you think this? Um, we're going to go into Romanticism and Transcendentalism, both of whom, both groups, had a view on uh, whether man was inherently good or evil. Um, Romanticism, which takes place uh, from roughly 1820 to 1860, overlaps with our Transcendentalism, which takes place from roughly 1830 to 1860. Um, those of course, are schools of thought. So it's not like everybody was like, no more thinking this way. They extend it out. I mean, there are people who still um, do transcendental meditation. There's a, a whole branch of transcendentalism that still exists. We still refer to romanticism. And you'll see, once we understand a little bit about each of them, how they do crop up in our current genres of film, in our current um in our current uh, modes of music, even in our, I remember there were these uh, TikToks that discussed uh, there were moods, right? Oh, that's a mood, right? That's influenced by all of the knowledge, all of the things that have come before. So we're looking at romanticism and transcendentalism. Um, some of it might look familiar, right? There's nothing new under the sun. There's just different names for it and add-ons. So romanticism, it came about as a response to the logic and order of the age of reason and the enlightenment. It's also a response to the burgeoning industrial era, um, which made people question what are these monoliths, what are these things that are cropping up, and what does it mean for us when we mechanize life, right? So people were looking to re, uh, reintegrate their natural world into their into their everyday life. Cities started to become very, very crowded at this time. Um, it's when we start to see ghettos happen in the cities. It's certainly when we have a lot of immigration. You haven't gotten there with history yet, but this is when we see a lot of immigration, people coming into the country, groups separating themselves, segregating themselves. Um, and it was... Um, a time of great transition in many, many, many ways. Um, this was actually an internationally international idea as well, particularly in England. England held on to Romanticism for quite a bit longer. They went pretty much right from Romanticism into the Victorian era. Romanticism was broad and these great large swaths of ideas celebrating large um, tracts of land, celebrating vastness, openness, celebrating wonder and um, the Victorian era, I always sort of think of it as the Victorian dress code, um, which was very, very conservative. And we see things like the corset come back in and everything was cinched in really tight, right? This very uptight, high collar, long sleeve, cinched in waist, big bustle, okay? Um, it was a way to, to a response to the to the flowiness of romanticism, right? Um, France, Germany, United States. Um, the, this affected areas of literature and art, particularly poetry, painting, short stories, and novels. Um, the romanticism, it, when, we, when it took hold in England, we might think of something like um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? That that text became a sort of central piece of romanticism. When we think about it in terms of America, we think about it in terms of our Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, who we'll be reading into. When we think of it in terms of um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, so it's starting. You're starting. You should be get, starting to get uh, this idea of the sort of darkness and lightness of romanticism. They actually believe that man is inherently good. Characteristics of romanticism, of romantic literature. They were interested in the common man and in childhood. They truly believed in the feeling over emotion, a uh, feeling and emotion rather, over logic and reason. Um, they felt like if you were trying to reason your way out of something, then you were probably overlooking the most important part, which was what was your intrinsic sort of response, your emotional response to something, which was going to be the more accurate and the more telling um, response. 
They're very, as we said, and as I was starting to say, inspired by nature. We'll take a look at some artwork that helps us to understand this. You have to remember, particularly in America, land in the frontier is one of our major themes this year. Inspired by nature is this massive concept in, in romanticism because we had massive pieces of land. To this day, we have such a broad landscape and such a broad range of landscape from literally from deserts to lush, um, to lush forests, to prairies, right? To the oceans. Um, but really we just have so many different vistas that are so inspiring and have always been so inspiring. This is what romantic literature really picked up on. Um, and they celebrate the individual. Now we know in America, the I is king. This is another element. The I is king. Individualism is going way back to, um, to just our asking for independence, right? We are who we are. We're not, we are not England. We are not your subjects. We are our own people. And within this group of our own people are people who are their own persons, right? So it's this massive push toward, um, what we all sort of rush to now as well. How do we set ourselves apart? Very American ideas. Also incredibly important. This was, um, so important of the indiv in celebrates the individual. That was really Americanized romanticism. Importance of the imagination, this veneration of the bizarre, the supernatural, and the gothic. That was universal. That was all people writing in, in the romantic style were definitely inspired by how far can my imagination go? What would happen if I were to put a brain of a, of a dead person into a, into a body that I stitched together, right? How far can my imagination take me? Let's go there. Okay. And we do, we, if we didn't have romanticism, it was bound to come up. These, this stretch of the imagination was bound to come up. And it certainly did with this romantic literature and the forms particularly of, as I mentioned, Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, I would like for you, and we'll go back into this, but this is The Indian's Vespers by Asher Brown Durand from 1847. And this just gives you, um, it gives you a taste of what the inspiration was, how inspiring the land was, right? And we have this Native American Right, and he appears to be some sort of like a leader or the the chief of his tribe, perhaps. But this arms raised in worship, and it's almost like the light of God beaming down right onto this man's chest, right to his feet, right out to the water, and then over here. I don't know if you guys have studied this. Maybe some of you have. Look at this really dark area right behind him. Right, there's this sense that. With all this goodness and light, there has to be an area of dark. And what it what it what is in those shadows? This is what we would call um, an area of light, and a section of what is obscured because of that light beams off one piece and is then um, creating shadow on another piece. This is what we call chiaroscuro, and we're going to explore chiaroscuro in. Um, the art, but then we're going to talk about chiaroscuro in literature because that is um, a lot of the way that Hawthorne writes is through the light and the darkness. Here we have um, On the Beach by Thomas Doughty. Um, consider what words or phrases might come to mind when viewing this this painting, right? What, what might you consider? This is again, look at all the land and animals. This is not necessarily a particular place. It's not actually a particular beach. It's not something, um, Dowdy said that it wasn't something that it was um, in front of him. This was from his imagination. This is what he felt American wildlife, Americans, American vistas looked like. Look at the motion of the clouds, the movement, right? We have a lot going on in the foreground as well of this painting. Again, we have our darkness down here, right? The center, the center piece is literally the man on the white horse. And that's quite romantic uh, as we know it. 
the man on the white horse is an iconic symbol in literature. It's our savior. And in, in this sense, this man is clearly involved with the animals, perhaps the, the herding of these animals, being in charge of the land. That's the new hero. The, Amer the new American hero was the person uh, taking care of our breadbasket, taking care of our, our meals, our food, our land. Now this as well is Romanticism. The Money Diggers by John Kidor, 1832. The Money Diggers. This brings up another American identity that we um, might not, might think is a more current idea, but it actually goes back quite a bit. The Money Diggers. We've always been interested in excelling our wealth. We've always been interested in becoming more prosperous, a more prosperous people. We have our fire lighting the middle. We have the the people here reacting, right? Reacting to these things in the shadows. And even the tree itself looks like it's attacking. So this is could be could it be a commentary on greed? Could it be a commentary on uh, selfishness? Is it a commentary on um, watch your back once you start to attain wealth? So we have a lot of interesting ideas and messages that come up with our romantic painters. Here's another element of our um, not so not the not necessarily the bright side of romanticism, but painted with our pastels, painted in beautiful tones, painted um, in some areas in muted tones. This is called Pompeii um, by Robert Duncanson, and this is um, a reflection of Pompeii, the the fallen city of Pompeii, um, which was destroyed, ruined by corruption, by greed, by it was burned, right? Um, Pompeii burned to the ground. People often have referred to America as the new Rome, as the new empire, right? This is 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 um, Duncanson giving us a his perspective on where he thinks we're headed. Are we headed to where Pompeii was, right? Um, people surveying the damage in the wake. Of the, of the ruins of Pompeii, almost like they're deciding what price to put on it. Um, but life, of course, um, the serene water goes on. So um, that is actually it for our romanticism. I want to go back, though, um, to here. Maybe while we're here, you guys can screenshot this. It's going to help you. Um, with your homework, because I want you to look for these themes in minister, uh, the Minister's Black Veil. Which one of these themes do you feel is um, popping up in your reading tonight? You're going to write about that a little bit. So hopefully um, you enjoyed this presentation, and hopefully you enjoy the Minister's Black Veil, written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was actually related to Judge Hathorne from the Crucible lore, right? But there actually was a Judge Hathorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne was um, displeased by this connection. So he put a W in his name and added an E at the end so as to distance himself slightly from that infamy that his family uh, was involved in. Interesting, right? All right, you may head to your homework.